Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the Art for All Sunday Forum that launches the virtual exhibit that we're going to have for November and December. The name of the show is, Is Anyone Home? Now I get to introduce three wonderful people. Um, Cheryl and David Evelo are dear friends and neighbors uh, who started Art for All in honor of their daughter, Stephanie. Um, she was a talented artist in spite of her disabilities, and she died in 2012. John and I've had the privilege of hearing a lot about Stephanie's determination, her creativity, and even her sassiness, and we wish that we had known her. In fact, sometimes we feel like we did know her. Um, Cheryl's comment after Stephanie's own exhibit at the University of Minnesota many years ago uh, is unforgettable to me. Quote, it became an important part of her life to think about herself as an artist, she said. Nick Fernholz is the project director at the University of Minnesota's Institute for Community Integration. And this is the organization that co-founded Art for All with the Evelos and continues to house and provide support to it. Um, we have heard from the Evelos and other people that Nick has been critical to the success of the program. We're excited to hear him talk about. So welcome to each of the three of you to Plymouth Church and to our Sunday Forum. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, John, Cody, and everyone from the Plymouth Arts Program who helped us with this virtual exhibit and today's forum. We're thrilled to be here to introduce you to Art for All and the wonderful artists that you're going to see. I'll, I'm going to begin by sharing a little bit about our daughter, Stephanie, and embedded in her life story are the changing social attitudes and living conditions for people with disabilities especially people with intellectual disabilities. David is then going to share a little bit more about Art for All, the Stephanie Evelo Fund for Art Inclusion, and our connection with the University of Minnesota. Um, and then Nick will introduce the artists and talk about their work. Following this, as, as John mentioned, will be time for some comments and questions. At six weeks, Stephanie was diagnosed with Down syndrome and she had the atrial septal heart defect, which is sometimes common with Down syndrome. Of course, it was a shocking diagnosis. It was very unexpected, especially for new parents. We were only 23 and 24 years old. In those days, heart surgery was in its infancy. Surgeries were experimental and mortality rates were high. Stephanie's cardiologist did not recommend it. This was also at a time when parents were often advised by well-meaning friends or family and particularly the medical community that we might be better off if we chose to give up our rights to the child and send the child to one of those state hospitals where they could be safe and taken care of. However, these were actually not hospitals. They were very large institutions that housed up to as many as 3,000 toddlers, school-age children, and adults. Maybe it was destiny that we had Stephanie because both David and I had teaching degrees in special education when she was born. I had worked at one of those large state institutions while I was attending college. After about a week or so, we both realized that this little baby we had welcomed home and loved was still that same sweet baby, except that now she had a label. And that label did not change how we felt about her. So we decided to move on and to live life as fully as possible, work around the health issues, and to continue living our lives as a family. 
All along, there were health issues. Early on, we were skeptical of doctors until we found the right ones who could care for her and support us. One doctor early on ended our visit by saying to us that we were lucky Stephanie had such a serious heart defect that nature would take its course. She also added that it would be hard for us to ever find a surgeon who would treat her. So from then on, we were always a little on guard. However, we were lucky to have had many wonderful, kind, and forward-thinking doctors throughout her life. Stephanie was a happy, funny baby who loved to tease. She grew up in our neighborhood with lots of other kids on the block. She went to daycare, swam in the pool at Mueller Park, and was doing all of the things that typical kids would do. When it was time for school, we wanted her to join her pals in our neighborhood and attend the neighborhood school. Again, this was a time in history when it was the norm for students who had developmental disabilities to attend a special K-12 school. And although this may have been a safe and protected environment with good teachers, it just didn't seem right that the public schools were replicating an institutional type setting they continued to exclude kids from typical experiences, and then they were really kept out of sight. Luckily, a couple of things were in play. David and I were both employed in the Minneapolis schools as special ed teachers, and by 1975, there were new laws and regulations that guaranteed the rights for students with disabilities to be included in typical classrooms whenever appropriate. Stephanie became the first student who had Down syndrome to be mainstreamed into regular kindergarten and elementary school classes. She received special education support. Stephanie had many good teachers along the way. And although there were some bumps here and there, Stephanie graduated from Roosevelt High School in 1990. She had a terrific transition plan that included school support staff and her first supervisor that she worked for at the Arthritis Foundation. Stephanie was hired to work as an office clerical support person right after high school. Stephanie was a very strong, opinionated and sassy girl who loved to travel. She loved Paris, Miami Beach and Duluth. She was always ready for adventure and she had a calendar full of social activities. She participated in Teen Connection and various community and park and rec programs for years. She was on a bowling league. She went to dances and other organized events. Most of all, Stephanie enjoyed making art throughout her life. Stephanie could move easily between her two worlds. She had social friends in both the disability community and in the world of non-disabled. She easily made friends at the bank when she went to Lunds or Macy's. People always reacted to her directness and her funny wit. She was a dedicated volunteer at the Basilica Nursery for 18 years. This was her spiritual home. Stephanie was always drawing, painting, making clay pots, jewelry, rug hooking, and she created a lot of scrapbooks. One of her strengths was that she had a vision for her future. She knew she wanted to work in an office and to live in her own apartment, to babysit and foremost to be independent. We were pretty sure that meant independent from us. We, she could hold her own and she could advocate very effectively for herself. She would frequently tell David and I that we should back off. We were overprotecting her. In high school, Steph announced to us that she was not going to live in a group home. There were just too many rules posted on their cupboards and there were hot dogs on their menus. By this time, she was a vegetarian and those things did not settle well with her. So we found ourselves breaking some new ground again. And in 1990, early 1990, we purchased a triplex on our block that we thought if it turned out, she could live in her own apartment with staff support. She was very motivated by this possibility and she learned to cook, 
kept track of her spending and balanced her checkbook. She continued to make art and she had great roommates who lived in the apartment with her and supported her. Steph did realize many of her dreams. She worked in several different office jobs in the community. She took Metro Mobility to, work, to and from work. She never let her disability define her. Once when I was driving her to one of her activities, I asked her if she had the address since I'd forgotten to bring it along and she didn't have it. We got into sort of a squab squabble and finally Steph said, don't ask me, I'm the one with disabilities. Stephanie led with her strengths, which made many people not even realize or know about her fragile health or the limits that she faced. Stephanie inspired many people throughout her life. Even though she passed away way too soon, it was better to have had her in our lives for 43 years than to have never had her at all. And now David will share. When, <clears throat> when Stephanie passed away in 2012, Cheryl and I were trying to determine how best to create a memorial in her name. Since Cheryl had worked in the 1980s at the University of Minnesota Institute on Community Integration, ICI, and I on federal transition grants, and I worked at ICI with Check and Connect, a federal grant in the 1990s. Uh, that was a dropout intervention project. And finally, Stephanie worked at ICI as a clerical assistant for eight years. It was fitting to try to come up with uh, something to memorialize her. Um, and so we talked to two of her supervisors. They reminded us how much Steph enjoyed art and how thrilling it was for her to have had her own art exhibit one summer at Patti Hall, the building where ICI is housed. The University of Minnesota Institute on Community Integration was established in 1985. It is a university center for excellence in serving people with a wide range of disabilities. Part of a national network in major universities and teaching hospitals across the country. ICI works to improve policies and practices that ensure all children, youth and adults with disabilities are valued and contribute to their communities of choice. ICI is home to over 70 grants and contracts. Staff members train direct support professionals, support school districts and develop state-of-the-art information and practices to ensure inclusion of individuals with disabilities. There was also a committee at ICI that um, was in-house and they did in-house art shows for staff as well as for people with disabilities. Cheryl and I joined the committee and together we established Art for All, the Stephanie Avalo Fund for Art Inclusion. The project is funded through donations and now has endowment status. Art for All, the Stephanie Avalo Fund for Art Inclusion does the following. It celebrates the ability of all people. It demonstrates the complexity of human beings. It proves we are more alike than different. It educates and informs the broader community about artists with disabilities and their vision of the world. It enhances an artist's sense of self-being and self-esteem and mental health and social and communication skills. It creates opportunities for artists with disabilities to share their work. ICI and projects like these act as a deterrent to make sure that our society never treats people with disabilities as they were once treated not that many years ago. Historically, people with disabilities were institutionalized or incarcerated for no crime committed without the benefit of due process. As a society, we have come a long way in how we treat people with disabilities. However, one will often hear people using the R word on TV, movies, and on the street. One day when Steph was eight or nine, she came home from school in a huff. She was upset. We asked what was wrong. And she said, someone had called her retarded. And that meant you were stupid, she said. I am not stupid, which summed up her feelings about the issue. 
and people with disabilities are not stupid. A few short years ago, we witnessed a politician on national TV mocking a person with a disability. Obviously, the work of ICI and projects like Art for All are still needed to make sure we do not dehumanize people with disabilities. Art for All was established to support artists by hosting art exhibits. We identify individual artists or a group of artists who work with an agency that supports people with disabilities. We have had art shows for people with a variety of life's challenges, such as people with intellectual developmental disabilities, mental health challenges, visually impaired, physically impaired, and people on the autism spectrum. We locate a community gallery or space where the artwork can be displayed. In the beginning of the project, most of the shows were on the campus at Patu Hall. However, in the past three years, the shows almost always are in the community, such as Birchwood Cafe, St. Mark's Episcopal Church, Maeve's Coffee House, and the Minneapolis Club downtown Minneapolis. Frequently, artists want to sell their work, while others choose only to show their work. The highlights for the exhibit is always the reception. This is a fun opportunity for families, agency people, general population, and donors to celebrate the artist's work perhaps meet the artist and purchase artwork. Food, wine, and beer are served at the receptions. At the reception, the attendees are encouraged to vote on their favorite piece. Votes are tallied and the Stephanie Award, a $100 gift card, is given to the artist whose work is determined to be the most popular of the show. The agency that supports the artist is also given a $100 gift card to help continue the support of the arts. On one occasion, the Stephanie Award was presented at an agency event. This is going to be a surprise award to the artist. The artist beamed to the delight and was all smiles. The $100 gift was a surprise and much appreciated. That is why we do the project. Family and friends of people with disabilities often don't get to share their achievements in a public way. One mother said, we never get to focus on our daughter. Her brothers are football stars and are in school plays and other school functions. She said, literally, this is one of the first times that she was the center of attention. After an art show last year, the family of one of the artists held a dinner in her honor for, for several family members and friends. The artists received flowers and calls from far and wide congratulating her. This is what the project is all about enhancing the lives of those with disabilities. And now, Nick will introduce the artist. Hey folks. Hello, my name is Nick Bernolds and I am the program manager for Art for All at ICI. I served on the Art for All committee for four years and have participated in the larger arts communities during that time. I wanna recognize a few people. Our committee members, Rebecca Dosh Brown, Mark Olson, McDonald Metzger, Caitlin Pearson, Cliff Potts, and Chet Cheddar, and our center director, Amy Hewitt. I'd like to briefly explain the organizational uh, vision of Art for All. Our main goal is to ensure the continuation of rotating art ex exhibitions and adding to the Evolo permanent art collection, but it does more than those topical activities, and the vision expands beyond those projects. Our initiatives provide a space for artists with disabilities to continue their art practice and profession in communities of their choice. And it engages and includes the broader arts communities. Using ICI's mission of improving practices, we intend to develop educational supports and increase community exhibitions to include more artists. Something unique with Art for All is that we only rely on donor gifts. More than 13 years ago, the founding members of the predecessor for Art for All made a key decision that not a single penny, not a single penny from the sale of an artist's work would be retained by the program. We continue that core value today and only rely on operating funds through donor gifts. Through generous gifts from donors, volunteers, 
support, donated supplies, and ICI staff time. Exhibitions continue, but these successes are challenging. I do have something exciting to announce. Thanks to years of support from many donors, this fund recently reached a big milestone. It is now at the endowment level. That means Art for All will now be supported permanently. However, the endowment alone is not yet enough to fully cover program costs. Every gift toward this fund brings us one step closer to that goal. This will be increasingly important as university budgets get more restrictive. In short, your gift can help ensure Art for All's future. Here are a few of the ways the funds are used. They provide art gallery space, receptions, educational pro programming, awards, scholarships, staff positions, lecture series, research, equipment, and supplies. If you are interested in giving a gift, please go to our website at art.ici.umn.edu. So with further ado, let's get on with the show. Our anchoring piece of the show is an image of a pinwheel back patio chairs overlooking a body of water. This piece was completed during the summer of the pandemic. And on this beautiful day, the chairs are empty when they should be seated full of people. The title of this exhibition is, Is Everybody at Home? A dutiful name for a time when people have been secluded and separated and the uncertainty of li life leaves us to pause and ask, is this all real? Am I the only one? Is everybody doing something different than they normally would? Or what is it that I should be doing? The artists in this show produce brilliant bodies of work, searching for a piece of <clears throat> normalcy and finding inspiration through a new host of daily activities while managing to be at home like everybody else. Lena Olson, Catherine Fitzgerald, Jeffrey Mickle, Jeremy Regan, Jimmy Regan, Devin Wilds, an artist from the country of Bhutan. Devin Wilds brings us our anchoring piece, the patio titled Wisconsin Union. Devin identifies himself as an artist and a man with autism. Using the language of art, Devin communicates through an array of mediums from sculpture, videography, jewelry, jewelry making, screen printing, and painting. This sublime ability to speak through his vivid body of work tells us his story over the last several months. Throughout this time, Devin has immersed himself in a massive amount of work using 14 inch by 17 inch paper and ink markers. These conceptual pieces like Wisconsin Union using vivid colors transcend, transcends the viewer into a parody, an animation like existence that comes from real form. Devin's most recent practice in his work are for photographers to submit their photographs to him and sharing their experiences in daily life during the pandemic. Devin then transforms this reality into playful scenes that create a new existence and redefine the substance world we live in. A graduate of Minnesota Life College, Catherine took evening classes in a program for young adults with autism and learning differences with a focus on creative pursuits. It was in this program that Catherine realized her gift for drawing. I always doodled and stuff, she said, but I have realized I'm pretty good at art. Today, Catherine's medium ranges from graphite, acrylic, watercolor, and digital art. Her practice includes a strict minimum 45 minutes per day in her art studio space. Through the Art for All program, Catherine has connected to buyers for commission-based work. Catherine lives independently with her dog, Louie. Catherine's soft stylizing provokes an emotive narrative, the fine lines opening up space into the almost unknown environments where the characters she creates tells of the stories and for the viewer to build upon that story into the environment of their choosing. Catherine's work spans the character spectrum growing from human to anthropomorphic creatures, gravitating toward primarily domesticated animals 
she's able to show the emotional story despite the realm of reality we're viewing them in. Like in Cat, where we see the emotions of the cat, its standstill hesitation, and almost curious observation of the butterfly to leave us wondering the greater context of the story. Or in Army Dogs, where they are suited up for an adventure, with each having their own particular role in the make-believe world. Again, Catherine leaves us to ponder the greater narrative. Beginning her art practice in Abu Dhabi 12 years ago, Lena Osman's work is heavily textured impressionism focused on animal and plant life. Lena identifies herself as a person living with cerebral palsy who uses her standard uh, device for mobility support, which allows her more flexibility in the studio. Lena lives and practices in Minneapolis. Using primarily our acrylic paint, Lena applies heavy texture onto the paper dividing the space of equal parts, darkness, and light. These color choices evoke temperature within the imagination. In Funky Jungle, Lena develops her practice by applying objects such as beads to draw on surrealism and uses humorous juxtapositions to depict travel, discovery, and excitement. After studying photography, Jeffrey Mickle found a special connection with his art practice. With over a decade in the profession of, uh, in his profession of choice, he has produced a large body of work and now owns an art gallery, River Bend Gallery in Galena, Illinois. Jeffrey identifies himself as a man with Down syndrome and a photographer. This photography is a means of expressing himself. Have you ever been to a place that captures all of your senses and you want it to last forever? Jeffrey catches elusive light that his eyes sees, but the camera often misses. At times, Jeffrey sees something the rest of us miss, like an old structure that can easily have been overlooked or forgotten. He will sense some moment in time when the wind is just right, the sun is just brilliant or dim, when the landscape is a awake to enchant us with its history. Jeffrey manages to create a stillness in time as a gift to those who want to feel that expression over and over again, or from far away, or from the confines of their own living room. His photographs are captivating, organic, and timeless. Influenced by Van Gogh, Picasso, and mid-century expressionism, Jimmy Regan began his career creating art in 2009. In this time, he has amassed a lengthy CV. His passion for color, texture, and the simplicity of an image pull the viewer deep into his body of work. Jimmy identifies himself as a man with complex autism, and his art practice offers him a means to illustrate his perspective of the world. Staying true to impressionistic stylizing, Jimmy uses ordinary subject matter, propelling the viewer in a movement of unusual visual angles with his brush strokes to an almost illusory universe. Everyday concepts, livestock, and fields are transformed with vivid color choices, meticulously placed on the canvas, creating a playful, dreamlike world. Jimmy uses a vast palette of color to capture a character's emotion and also brings us pieces like pixels and triangles with a kaleidoscope of geometric shapes, but playing with the congruency of blocks, line segments, and points to produce something truly organic, a fixed object yet continues to fool the eye as if it were in motion. <clears throat> The Bhutanese artists from the Drashko Locational Training Center for Special Children and Youth practice their art in training in Thinfu, the capital of city of Bhutan. Drashko is a center of excellence in Bhutan, providing state-of-the-art training and support mm -hmm. services for vocational training, employment, and quality living for persons with disabilities. Nestled with the countries of Tibet, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Myanmar, 
The kingdom of Bhutan is located in the Eastern Himalayas in South Asia. The people of Bhutan have a rich and ancient culture of creating magnificent pieces of art. Bhutan society is built on the concept that all citizens participate in a socioeconomic development of the country to ensure its success and longevity. Artists at Draksho continue this concept to ensure the sustainability of their mission. To ensure persons with disabilities have quality opportunities for developing skills for life and vocation, becoming self-reliant, making a living, and lead a contended life. A highly religious country, artists produce massive bodies of work honoring their deities, depicting them in mo modified forms. Like in these two pieces, each, the Buddha, or awakened one, is a title for someone who has attained nirvana. Cultural themes, colors, and adornments, like the lotus or lack thereof, each have a meaning. In January of this year, ICI was host to visitors from Bhutan, partners on one of our projects. I asked one of the representatives why the pieces of art do not have titles or artist names. This is what he said. When an artist in Bhutan renders a deity, it is culturally important to the viewer or worshiper to only focus only on the deity. By providing claim or non-religious affiliation, like a title or signature, the artists would then be placing more significance on themselves and taking away from the symbol for worship. He further said, however, each artist will make slight modifications in color, items or angles of an item. It's like their fingerprint on the piece, no other is exactly like it. That concludes the artists of our shows, uh, of our show. On behalf of Art for All and the Institute on Community Integration, I wanna thank the talented staff and volunteers at the Plymouth Congregational Church for putting the show together. I want to especially thank those who Cheryl, David, and I have worked with, Lynette Black, Elizabeth Blanchett, Tom Bloom, Cody Burdott, Sonia Cairns, John Humphrey, Rebecca Miller, James Rocco. I also want to thank, excuse me, I also want to thank our ICI director, Amy Hewitt, with the vision, fortitude, and passion to see this program reach new heights. I especially want to thank the artists in the show. Thank you for making art. Thank you for being part of the art community. And thank you for allowing us to be a part of your work in your practice. To be involved in Art for All, consider attending the art exhibits and especially receptions where you can meet the artists, purchase art, and generally have a good time. If you would like more information on Art for All, please check out our website at art.ici.umn.edu. To visit the virtual gallery, gallery please go to plymouth.org slash explore slash arts. Finally, putting together a virtual show is an exceedingly challenging task. Navigating technologies, communicating through virtual meetings, and the inability to witness the art up close and personal. I truly hope during this time everybody is at home in a safe and comfortable place with the ability to pull out your sketchbook and make some art. Thank you very much. Now I'm gonna hand it off to John for some Q&A. So we have a question here. Is Art for All able to help artists with disabilities become part of the larger art community? Maybe? Uh, I can answer that question. That is one of our um, big, big motivators or our big um, mission and vision is that we want to have a call for, for artists, emerging artists who are just beginning or professional and you've been doing this a number of years for you to be part of us. And so we can support you and, and bring you into the network of the, the larger arts community. Great, thank you. Nick, I have a question, and I'm, again, I'm not quite sure who to direct this one to, and that is, um, 
are there opportunities? Obviously, this the answer to this could take weeks. So try to to not take weeks. Um, are there opportunities for uh, people with disabilities to get involved in music or theater or dance, not just visual arts? So, yeah, uh, programs like that or partnerships like that. Yeah, you know, um, uh, I'll answer a little bit, but David and Cheryl may have. Um, a further question. I think the great thing about the Minneapolis, St. Paul, and really the state of Minnesota um, is that we have an enormous arts community uh, that's fine art to uh, uh, music and theater. And there are currently um, organizations out there that do both fine art and theater and music art for persons with disabilities and artists with disabilities. Did you have anything? No, I don't think so, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, some more questions here. Can we bid online for the art? That, that, would, be, uh, that would be a question. You can go to the, um, the Plymouth.org uh, slash explorer slash art, um, and then they have contact information on there. But that might be a question more for Sonia, too. Okay. Can community members volunteer in some way to serve this amazing organization? I'll get to that. I think Sonia might have something about how to purchase art. Um, I saw a chat um, by Seth Patterson, one of our ministers at Plymouth, where he put the website on the chat, so we'll follow up also after the show to make sure you all have access to that. But the answer is yes, we would definitely like people to buy art because they they were introduced to it in this show. We should go we'll take responsibility art. for following yeah. up how you how you do that. Could, could I ask a question now that is different from this? John, sure. is it okay for Absolutely. me? Absolutely. So during the planning of this show, in which I was mainly an observer, I either I read that a parent of one of the artists said that a huge value is not only does the artist begin to see themselves as more than a person with disability but the families of the artists do. And I wonder if one of you, David or Cheryl or Nick, could comment more about that, what that's like in the family dynamics. Well, I think as one, one mother said that, you know, it switches the conversation. All of a sudden this person isn't the person with a disability, that person is the artist. And that's really important. Another part of the pro program and a focus that we work on is that we want other people to see, not just parents, not just their teachers, but the general population to see that we are all different. We all have talents. These are human beings. They're not just some labeled group. And that's kind of the direction we take. So. And I just wanted to, uh, oh, I just wanted to add that that's the one, that's the one thing with the Art for All program is that we never want to have a power over the artists. We, they, we ask them, we want them to be part of us. And, and when they say, yes, I would love to be a part of you, we're just so happy that they will. So it's always a partnership. It's always a partnership. Um, and it's, they're always an artist first in, in with Art for All and, in that and I think John you had a, a, a question um, that I interrupted you <laughs> no problem that's right we wanted to get back to that previous answer to the previous question so the unanswered question on the table is can community members volunteer in some way to serve this amazing organization I'll have one of you answer mm -hmm. Go ahead. well I think that um, yes is the answer basically um, we're gearing up for um, developing a lot uh, website um, and a lot more information is going to be coming out on a regular basis. Um, and so we'll have an opportunity for people to tune in to um, the newsletters that we're putting out and that sort of thing. And so when we have exhibits coming up, we're certainly going to be starting to advertise 
um, as early as possible so that people can step up and volunteer, contact any one of us on the committee. Um, and we really welcome um, people to, uh, to nominate somebody if they know someone who's an artist who's not yeah. already affiliated with you know, an agency or they would like to be a part of Art for All. Um, we've gotten a number of our artists just word of mouth. So, um, and then when it comes time for the the reception and the opening, we will of course welcome all kinds of help. Sonia, did you have a comment you wanted to add here? No, John did. So John. Okay, great. Did. Hey, David, can you and Cheryl, can you talk about the new location for all the things you're doing? Well, I think Nick is the one to do yeah. that. I mean, we can talk about it, but you'll get the real information from him. <laughs> uh, so uh, I have a little bit of information that I can share based on your question. So you must have heard that um, ICI is planning on moving to a new location. Um, and, and that is true. Uh, they are going to the, the new building is the Masonic Institute for Brain Health. And in that building, um, as they're starting to renovate it, they asked about purchasing art. And um, our uh, ICI director, Amy Hewitt said, well, that's, that's actually amazing that you want art in here. We have, a, we're, we have our own program of artists in the community and we have a permanent collection. And so I am working with those project uh, managers to have that there will be a rotating art exhibit. And the details of that um, are not as fine at the moment, but um, that's what I have for you in the, the new building. Super, sounds exciting. Um, just a quick reminder to everybody, you can type in questions in the Q&A button. Um, you can also raise your hand if you would prefer to ask your question out loud rather than have to type in. So again, feel free to, to, answer, to ask your question in any way that fits for you. We have one more question here. Um, do you work in collaboration with other groups that do similar work like Upstream Arts and Interact? Um, yeah, I can answer that. that. That is the one, that is our one huge vision that we have and our, our, our focus is to collaborate with other organizations all over, all over the Metro. And um, we work with Interact um, occasionally, uh, Hammer, um, PRI and Avivo, those are all some of the, the organizations that we work with. And then there are, there are galleries uh, that also uh, want to work with us uh, to bring a lot of this art uh, from campus into the, co the community. And I think that now that we've been going through the stay at home and the, through this pandemic, we have really learn how to bring art to people's homes in a virtual way. And so that's just gonna open up more doors for people that can't travel from far away, or maybe we can have a show, um, for a, a virtual show with an artist who's in far North Minnesota, and we can bring all of, all of these artists from all over the place um, where it was a little bit more difficult when it was on, on site. And that includes organizations that are um, in other parts of Minnesota and the United States. And as you can see, we have international artists as well. And so this virtual platform that we're working with and that you're seeing is definitely a way that we'll be able to collaborate with more organizations. Another question here for Dave and Cheryl. Um, when you you know, when Stephanie was was little, it seemed like there was a strong commitment there to encourage her as an artist on your part. Um, did were there resources that you were able to find um, that were able to help you in that at all? Well, <clears throat> I can answer so, this from Cheryl. Um, I, I was undergraduate. I was an art major, and ah. so there's a lot of artists in our family. 
as art. small as our family is, and I taught art. But actually, Stephanie was self-directed. I mean, she didn't want us to help with things. I mean, she was very independent. And so she kind of initiated her own things, and we would buy the supplies and whatever. But with, with the art, as well as school things, she would say, you're not my teacher. I don't want to do math with you. And kind of, the art was sort of to that degree, not quite as much, but sort of that she, way. She had uh, her grandmother, David's mother, was also an artist. And so I think there was just a little bit of that passed, passed along to Steph. And, and her, her grandmother would spend a long time, a lot of time with Steph, just drawing and doing art projects and stuff. So we, it, it was more organic than anything right. that we really, we, we didn't hire any kind of tutors or art teachers for her. She just, we let her go. Okay, great. We have time for one more question here. Uh, this one says, the art in the exhibit is wonderful. Are there artists in Art for All who are more interested in participation rather than mastery of an art form? Hmm. I don't I I would suspect that is true I think because with our show sometimes we have artists who their whole vocation is to be an artist and that's what they focus on but we have other shows where it's more of a hobby and some of those artists are very good as well I mean a lot of the, the art is so honest and, and so lovely that you don't have to be someone who's just focused on the, on the artwork that they might just do it as a hobby and they might only have one show. That's it. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if this is possible. Uh, Cody, feel free to step in if you have suggestions on how to do this. Can we unmute everybody and have a round of applause for our wonderful presenters and this great presentation? I'll, <laughs> I'll start. No, that, that's not really possible. We can't really do that. Okay. Well, Sorry, and Dave and Nick and Cheryl, thank you so much. And you'll just have to imagine the applause <laughs> <laughs> because and it really was. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Could I person. add my thanks Sonia. from Plymouth, um, from the Plymouth community? We are so grateful to you, Nick and David and Cheryl. I mean, you have really exposed us to something that's really, really important. And now we know we can't unknow what we learned from you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.